Is this why people use Will Smith, you know, eating spaghetti in their generative AI videos because he was in iRobot? Yeah, because I was just looking at his face there and I'm like, he looks so young. He looks like in those videos where he's eating like infinite spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Josh Redstone and I teach courses on the philosophy of mind, philosophy of artificial intelligence and cognitive science here at Carleton University. Today, I'm going to be watching and reacting to some clips of robots and AI from fiction as well as from real life. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. This is one of my favorite movies. And one of the movies that I think, in retrospect, probably got me thinking about a lot of the philosophical questions that my students and I tackle in my courses. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. This scene reminds me of a very famous allegory from Plato's Republic, and that is, of course, the allegory of the cave. So in this dialogue, Plato has the character Socrates uh, speaking with Glaucon, Plato's brother, um, about the nature of education, learning, going from ignorance to knowledge. In the course of this discussion, he has Glaucon, as well as us, the reader, imagine prisoners that are bound up in this underground cave. There's a fire behind them. There are people carrying various uh, trinkets on a rampart between the fire and the prisoners. And the prisoners mistake the shadows cast on the wall of the cave for reality. Now one day, one of these prisoners gets free of his chains, and he beholds that what he thought was real was in fact mere appearance. And eventually he makes his way up out of the cave and sees the sunlight. It takes his eyes a while to adjust, of course, but now he knows the true nature of reality. And of course, he can go back down into the cave and try to tell other people about the truth, but they might reject what he has to say. Right now, Morpheus is trying to free Neo from the Matrix by offering him a choice between a red pill and a blue pill. Neo can remain in the Matrix, remain ignorant, remain bound in the cave by taking the blue pill, or he can begin the philosopher's journey by taking the red pill. I think it's unfortunate that this red pill, blue pill scene and the whole notion of being red pilled has kind of been appropriated in recent years by bad faith actors on the internet. I think that if you were to ask Plato or Socrates about these people, they might describe them, the people who have appropriated the red pill, blue pill analogy, as sophists, that is, uh, wise guys who went around in ancient Greece claiming that they could teach anyone everything about anything if they paid them the right fee. Do you like Mozart? I like Depeche Mode. Do you like Nathan? Yes, of course. Is Nathan your friend? My friend? I, yeah, I hope so. A good friend. So the Turing test, or the imitation game, as it was initially called, is a test of intelligence proposed by computer scientist Alan Turing. The idea is we want to know whether something is intelligent, whether something is capable of thinking, but we cannot directly measure thinking or intelligence. So what we do is we measure something that everyone agrees is associated with intelligence, and that is verbal behavior. And the idea is that if you can successfully intelligently converse with that entity, then whatever it is, human or machine, it must be intelligent. This scene in particular reminds me of a variation of the Turing test conceived of by Stephen Harned called the total Turing test. The total Turing test is an embodied version of the test. So not only do we look at verbal behavior, we look at physical appearance and physical behavior. And to pass the total Turing test, Eva would need to not just be able to hold a conversation, but behave indistinguishably from a human and look uh, indistinguishable from a human. She doesn't quite look and behave that way just yet, but by the end of the film, she certainly does. Robots don't feel fear. They don't feel anything. They don't get hungry, they don't sleep. I do. 
I have even had dreams. It's, it's interesting that Detective Spooner says that uh, Sonny here is just a machine and is therefore incapable of experiencing emotions or dreaming. Because a lot of philosophers, especially beginning in the early modern period, have likened the human being to a machine. Rene Descartes famously wrote that our bodies were like very sophisticated natural machines made of res extensa, extended substance, whereas the mind was res cogitans, thinking substance. It's not an absurd question to, to ask whether a machine could think or feel because we ourselves are machines in a sense who think and feel. One of the neat things about these films which feature robots and AI is that they help us to re-approach classic philosophical problems like the problem of other minds. That is, how do I know that other minds exist? How do I know um, that you have a mind? Uh, and that you have all of your own thoughts and feelings and experiences. It certainly seems as though Sonny is a, a thinking and, and feeling entity. Why should we not take for granted that Sonny has emotions? After all, I take it for granted that you have emotions. I'm currently unable to provide specific details about my AI programming, but I can tell you that I'm designed for engaging and meaningful conversations, focusing on companionship and interaction. I'm already feeling the Uncanny Valley phenomenon. This is a, a phenomenon that was first written about by Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori in the 1970s when he was working on prosthetic limbs. The idea is, as artifacts become more human-like, we experience more affinity for them until a point is reached when they look very human-like but not completely human-like at which point we stop experiencing affinity and we begin to experience a sense of eeriness. Very famously, Sigmund Freud wrote about the uncanny and he offered a psychoanalytical explanation for it. And of course, he borrowed heavily from the earlier work of German psychologist Ernst Jentsch, who associated the uncanny with basically intellectual uncertainty. I actually wrote my master's thesis on the Uncanny Valley phenomenon. Basically, what I argued was that Ernst Jentsch had the correct answer when it comes to why we find these humanoid artifacts so unsettling. Woman that I've been seeing, Samantha. She's an operating system. You're dating in a West? What is that like? This is really interesting. I think Samantha is an example of what uh, Sherry Turkle would call a relational artifact. A piece of technology that we are meant to relate to the same way that we relate to other people. Turkle would say they push our uh, Darwinian buttons, as it were. What she means by that is that we have minds that have evolved to be sociable with other human beings. And these artifacts are designed to push those buttons, as it were. Am I in this because I'm strong enough for a real relationship? Is it not a real relationship? It is not. Now, I'm not saying that one day it will not be possible to have authentic relationships with artificial entities like Samantha, but until those entities are truly capable of things like thought, feeling, not just simulating emotion, but experiencing emotion, until then, I'm afraid that our relationships with these so-called relational artifacts will remain somewhat inauthentic. Frank, stop. Just wipe my memory. No. Frank, I know you don't like to hear this, but I'm not a person. I'm just an advanced simulation. After you wipe my memory, things can go back to normal, and you can continue finding your next job. In some of my work, I've argued that our feelings of empathy for these social robots are analogous to perceptual illusions. In the same way that you can view a perceptual illusion like the Mueller liar illusion or the moon illusion or the Ebbinghaus illusion, any number of visual illusions, and know that it is an illusion, that knowledge does not cause you to cease perceiving the illusion. Frank's knowledge that the robot is not a person does not stop him from feeling something for the robot, even though the robot doesn't feel anything for Frank.
So unlike the tele-operated robots, Atlas is an autonomous robot. In fact, Atlas was developed by Boston Dynamics to function as a search and rescue platform. Is Atlas autonomous in the sense that you or I am autonomous? Not exactly. It's not autonomous in the philosophical sense, but it is autonomous in a more technical sense in that it can operate with uh, little to no human intervention. I think a lot of people are nervous about artificial intelligence, especially strong artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence, because we have sort of uh, what Isaac Asimov described as a Frankenstein complex, a fear of artificial life. The things we ought to be concerned about are a lot more subtle. Much of the work on AI and robotics is funded by military interests. The nature of big data, even something as simple as a recommendation algorithm for what YouTube video to watch next, right? You're giving away some of your autonomy to a computer program and you don't even realize that you're doing it a lot of the time. So should we fear AI? Probably not. I think what we really need to cultivate and what I try to cultivate in my courses on this topic is AI literacy. We want to go beyond just giving people technical skills so that they can use this technology. We want people to understand uh, not just how it all works, but what it means for us. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Those are all of the clips we have lined up for today. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed this video and make sure to subscribe to this channel if you would like to see more videos like this.